Hi, my name is Bob Marzano. I'm from Empower Learning. Uh, and this recording is uh, one of a set that we're doing on the relationships uh, between or among uh, competency-based education, equity, uh, and learning management systems. Um, and um, uh, that might seem like a strange uh, combination of elements, but we we believe that equity obviously is a very big issue in K-12 education, always has been and uh, you know, probably will be in, uh, you know, in the foreseeable future. That doesn't mean we can't get a lot better at it. Now, by the way, the way we define equity is it's that the quality of being fair and impartial. Uh, and we mean that from kind of all angles, if you will. Imagine a K-12 system uh, that... Um, uh, regardless of a student's background, uh, ethnicity, income, they were actually schools represented an environment that was fair to them in terms of their access to information, their um, the quality of education that they received, and impartial in terms of uh, you know the feedback that they received, um, the um, uh, how they were scored, how they were graded. Uh, and uh, that takes, you know, that's taking uh, what we're talking about equity in a very, very broad sense. And we honestly believe, not surprisingly, since we're a learning management uh, co system company, that without, uh, you know, if your learning management system does not have specific characteristics, it is very hard to create equity uh, as we're defining it here. We also believe that a key to this is competency-based education. So really it goes this way. Uh, if you want equity, uh, then we say competency-based education is the structure which prob probably gives you uh, the uh, best, uh, you know, the highest probability of, of achieving equity. And you're gonna have to have a learning management system that's designed, you know, for competency-based education. Uh, so obviously we're going to be talking about um, you know empower learning. You can go to our website and you know take a look at um, you know what this particular system looks like. Uh, really, the focus today in, in, in this recording uh, is assessments. You know the way uh, uh, K twelve education designs assessments, scores assessments, reports assessments. So it's really this this session will be in two parts. One will be kind of the theory behind or the logic, I should say, behind our assertion that assessments as they're currently used really represent a barrier to equity. Um, now, of course, we want assessments to be reliable and valid. Validity means they're measuring what they say they do. Uh, reliability means that uh, they're consistent, uh, that if you gave, gave a student the same test the next day and he forgot that he took it the day before, they, they would get the same score, scores. Now, uh, here's some deep theory for you, uh, or uh, uh, you know, historical research on this. Um, the, uh, the formulas that we use to determine a, a test reliability really go back over 100 years now, and they were not designed to tell you how reliable the score of an individual student is. They were designed to tell, tell you, us educators, uh, how stable a pattern of scores would be. So let me illustrate this. Uh, it, it, a little bit technical, but I think very interesting. Uh, uh, here's the uh, a traditional uh, definition of reliability. Uh, let's say we have 10 students and we give them, and we have a test, and we give them, a, a, you know, we administer the test and student number one receives a 97, student number two receives a 92, all the way down to student 10 with a 65. Okay, now, let's say the next day you really did give that test and magically the students forgot that they took the test. I always like to say, remember Men in Black, the Will Smith version of Men in Black, which I really love, the diversions. I had the little gizmo that he would, you know, a pen and he would hit it and a big light would shine. Uh, that, and they they forget, anybody who saw it would forget. Imagine Will Smith was there and he, you know, he zapped him and uh, the, the people, who 10 people couldn't remember they took the test. So they take it the next day, can't remember the first administration. The next day, now they get slightly different scores. Student one gets a 98, student gets a, a two gets a 90, et cetera, a student 10 gets a 66. So they're close, you know, but there are some differences here. Uh, the um, the correlation between those two two administrations are technically the reliability. Now it's impossible to get that those two administrations because people aren't going to forget in one day that they took the test. But theoretically, that's how reliability is fine, uh, defined. And in this case, that correlation was a 0.96, which is a really high reliability. Remember, reliability is go from zero to one. One mean there's a perfect relationship. You know, 1.0, you never get that. Uh, zero would mean there's no relationship in between the, the test taken on the first day and the test taken on the, the, the second day. Let me change this now a little bit. 
Uh, let's suppose the first, uh, the first day they get these scores, the, you know, the 97 for student one and the 65 for student two. But now Will Smith comes in the next day. All the students are there, uses a little gizmo. Uh, now they take the test and they get a different pattern. So we look at the, what's called the second administration, or administration B here. So the student who got a 97 now gets an 82. Second student who got a 92 now gets an 84. Ten, student 10 who got a uh, 65 now gets a 78. That correlation between that administration and the, sec and, and the second is now 0.32, which is a very, very low reliability. So reliabilities, as reported on tests, external assessments, just tell you, well, the pattern of, 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 of uh, scores within a group of students stay stable. It's for a group of students. For individual students, you know, it doesn't, doesn't tell us much. So what does this tell you about the precision of individual student score? This being the reliability of a test that's designed by state, district, you know, um, you know that has the traditional reliability, not much. So an individual student score on any type of test, it, you really can't count on it being accurate. So let me add a little more, little more uh, uh, to that statement, because that was a heck of a statement. Gregory Sizek, who's a, a specialist in, uh, in measurement theory, uh, in a book in 2007, actually on formative assessment, he looked at a large Midwestern state's test in mathematics uh, and just looked at its reliability, which was a 0.87. That's good reliability. People would say, that's great. Our students should take that, and you know, we will know how well they're doing. Uh, now, there were subscale scores, and so that means there was an overall score for mathematics, but there were also scores for estimation and mental computation, geometry, measurement, number and number relations, patterns, algebra, problem solving. Those are the subscales. Now, the subscale reliabilities range from 0.33 to 0.57. Those aren't high reliabilities. The, um, uh, usually, you're looking for reliability, usually 0.8, maybe down to 0.75s, but 0.33 and 0.57. That's, those aren't good reliabilities. Those aren't strong reliabilities. Now, here's the killer. He said the reliability of different scores. Now, here's what a different score is. That's when a teacher uses, let's say I'm Bobby, I'm in your class, you're the teacher. Uh, I take this math test uh, I, and I get an overall score, but you want to look at how well I did on the subscale scores so you can say, gee, we should work on this with Bobby because that's his lowest score. So let's say you say geometry was my lowest score, by golly, I should, um, you know, you, you should work on that with me. That's a different score because you were, you didn't compute it, but you were looking at the differences on my performance on the subscales. The reliability of different scores on this test was 0.015. That's almost zero. Now, this is a good test. This is not critiquing the test at all. This is just an illustration that tests and the reliability estimates, uh, the, the, the reliability uh, indices that are reported, you know, are not designed to say how, how reliable, how stable an individual score is. Uh, here's a quote from uh, Sysik. It's a long one, you know, but it's, it's a powerful one. I'll read it to you to make it easy. Uh, it might be that the dependability of conclusions about differences in sub-area performance is nearly zero. Those are the subscale scores. In many cases, a teacher will flip the coin and decide whether to provide the pupil with focused intervention in algebra, the heads, or measurement, that's tails, will be making about the same uh, the decision as uh, about as accurately as the teacher who relied on the examination of subscore differences for the two areas. Now, that's really powerful. Now. Traditional uh, test theory is based on this simple formula. The score that a student receives on a test, you know, that's called the observed score, is made up of two parts, the true score and the error. The true score is what the student really deserved. In, you know, in a perfect situation, you know, a student was tired, you scored, the, the, the items, you know, were interpretable, uh, it was scored you know, uh, accurately. Uh, that's the true score. But there's also error, and error, error can either work to artificially inflate an observed score or artificially deflate an observed score. Uh, here's what gets really kind of scary when you start applying this to scores on tests. Uh, so let me explain this, uh, this uh, uh, matrix I have here. Uh, here's, uh, 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 this represents three le four levels of reliability. A test with a reliability of 0.85, that's really good. A test with a reliability of 0.75, that's okay. All the way down to a test with a reliability of 0.55. Now, a student gets a score of 75. Now, but let's, let's look at how, how, how much error uh, there is in that score as the reliability of the test gets lower and lower. So the observed score is 75 in all situations. And let's look at the, high, the best case scenario. This is the test that has a reliability of 0.85. Now, 
Knowing the reliability in a thing called the standard deviation, you can actually compute what's called a confidence interval, 95% confidence interval. Um, uh, you know, and, and with a confidence interval, you can say, gee, there's a 95% possibility, uh, probability, uh, that the student's true score is between this score and this score. So let's look at the, the test with a 0.85 reliability. Okay. Uh, you, given that reliability, you compute the 95% confidence interval, and you can say you're 95% sure the student's true, for, true score is anywhere between a 68.63 and an 81.37. That's a 12, almost 13-point range. In other words, take the observed score, you know, and then plus or minus 6.37, and you got the range. Now, that's a big range, even with the test with that reliability. Let's go down to the worst-case scenario. Where the student, where the test has a reliability of 0.55, now that student with a 75, you know, the range in which his or her true score could fall is anywhere between a 65.06 to a 85.94. Now that's huge. That's just absolutely huge. So what creates that error? That's the question. And what does that relate? And how does that relate to equity? Well, error can be the test was not well constructed, but it can also be things that were dealt with cultural bias. You know, a student read an item and it used terminology the student didn't understand, but the student really understood the content. Student doesn't, doesn't read well. Had the test been presented orally, the student would have done well. Uh, it's second language. The student is non-native English speaking. The test is in English. Uh, it could be student engagement with the test. Student just says, hey, I don't like tests, and they don't try. So there's all kinds of error, you know, that are, is, is, is due to characteristics the student brings to bear. They aren't the student's fault, but just that the tests, you know, don't even take those into consideration. The best you can do is look at how much error there is. And there's a lot of tests. Paper pencil tests will have error. That's, you know, there's, there's no two ways about it. So what do we do? Stop using paper pencil tests? No, we don't do that, you know, but we expand the ways we test students, or better yet, we expand the ways we assess students. You see, assessment technically is gathering information, any type of information about a, a student's particular knowledge, you know, on a particular topic, knowledge and skill of a particular topic at a certain point in time. And a test is one way of doing it, but there are many other ways of doing it. I'll briefly go over some of those in a moment. Uh, to do that now, to have uh, to to expand the range of the ways of uh, gathering information or assessing students about uh, you know that. Uh, uh, we really have to uh, line up curriculum a different way and also use multiple forms of assessment. How do we line up curriculum in a different way? What we recommend is that you create proficiency scales for the important topics uh, that are uh, in, in your content. Now, a competency-based system does this. You, you, can't, you can't have a competency-based system, system without identifying what are the topics at fifth grade, fourth grade, you know, in math, science, ELA, social studies that you consider important. Uh, so every competency-based system identifies topics. We say go a step further and create what we call proficiency scales. And we use a very straightforward, or we recommend, and you can use uh, our LMS without using this particular uh, scale, but we recommend it highly. Um, the, uh, uh, and it really has five levels. There's the target we're shooting for. This happens to be eighth grade uh, um, uh, topic on at of atmospheric pr uh, processes in the water cycle. Here's the target we're shooting for in understanding of, you know, that we want st eighth grade students to know uh, how the water cycle processes uh, impact climate, also the effects of temperature and pressure in different layers of Earth's atmosphere. That's what we're shooting for. But we also are probably going to teach you know, some of the simpler content because we can't be sure students know, know that uh, coming in. Uh, terms such as climatic patterns, atmospheric layers, stratosphere, troposphere. Also that students uh, have some basic facts like precipita precipitation is one of the processes of the water cycle and so on. And in our scale, we always say, let's put an advanced level, a level that goes above and beyond our target. Okay, just, you know, because there'll be students who want to get that highest. That's called advanced. Um, now, that's, a, uh, you know, where uh, you, you can state that generically, like the student infers relationships regarding atmospheric processes in the water cycle. Or you can actually create the scale so that the advanced level uh, is described. So describe is a is a specific task. In this case, describe and defend what might occur to climatic patterns in a specific location, given a dramatic change in one specific process of the water cycle. So that's what curriculum would look like. You know, tar uh, topics organized into proficiency scales. Proficiency scales have target learning uh, a target learning goal, uh, and um, 
uh, simpler content and advanced content. Pretty simple scale, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay? 3 is the target, uh, 2 is the simpler content, simpler goal, uh, 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 1 means partial credit with help, 0 even with help, no success, and 4, you know, that's the advanced uh, learning goal. That's the whole scale. Now, uh, given that, we can have multiple forms of assessment. Of course, one is going to be a traditional test. We could design a test or mini tests using that scale. You know, we have items at the 3.0 level, items at the 2.0 level, items at the 4.0 level. We score a test, but instead of putting a number like a 75 out of 100, you actually use the scale, you know, to record how well they did in the test, like a 2. Two means the student knows all of the simpler content, but none of the more complex content at the score point 3.0 level. If the student knows the 2.0 content and some of the 3.0 level, then they get a 2.5. So there are interim scores you can use too. Now, tr uh, tr tr uh, proficiency scales have many advantages. One is transparency. Okay, transparency means that students know exactly what's expected of them. Now, the scale I just showed you, that, that type, is used in all 50 states, in some places a lot, in some places uh, less than a lot. But, uh, you know, the, you see them up all over in, in the, on, you know, students that are all pasted all over the room. Students uh, estimate where they think they are. They write their own, uh, their own uh, versions of it. Now, what do assess assessments look like? Uh, well, we can use the traditional test. But we can also use things like essays, we call them quick writes. You can use performance tasks, we call them show me's. We can use probing discussions where a teacher sits down with a student, you know, and says, okay, that 3.0 content, explain that to me. You know, explain the water cycle to me. And what if this happened? Explain that to me. 2.0 content, what does this word mean? What is this word? Give me some basic facts, you know, about the water cycle. 4.0, see if you could tell me what would happen if like that. Probing discussion as a teacher sits down with a student and just has a conversation. Uh, student self-assessments with verification. Students can say, I think I'm a three. Well, that's great. It's, now, how are you going to prove that to me, Bob? You know, show me that you're a three. Student-generated assessments, you know, that's where students, they come up with the assessment, you know, for themselves. Voting techniques, observations, uh, the, uh, so many different ways of, um, of assessing students. All of those assessments are, you know, are turned into a score on a scale, uh, and that's what we use to record how students have done on a particular topic over time. Now, here's where your uh, learning management system comes in. Imagine that uh, there were 15 topics in mathematics at the fourth grade level, and each student's gonna have multiple scores. Uh, and uh, now remember, these scores are not always for traditional tests. As a matter of fact, in a system like this, you're probably gonna test less, but assess more. I'll say it again. You'll probably test less but assess more, which means you're going to be using probing discussions, observations, student self-assessment, student-generated assessments, uh, voting techniques, uh, show me's, etc., etc. So students for each topic will have multiple scores. So you want to keep track of that. Well, here's what your LMS should do. For each topic, your LMS should you know, first of all, you know, record, a teacher just enters the score. It's this topic that I sat down with Bobby and had a conversation. Teacher enters the score that's kept track of. So in this case, uh, the, uh, the, the teacher, uh, these are my scores. I'm the student, Bobby. You're the, you're, you're the teacher. And you've entered th three scores for me. First score, I got a 1.5, then I got a 2, uh, and then I got a 3. Uh, and then show you that, give you a chart. Well, this is the chart. All the teacher has to do is enter the scores for a topic. Uh, and so every, when you, when you, uh, it, so all students won't have the same, same number of assessments. Uh, kind of a general rule for us is that the less sure you are of a student's achievement, the more assessments you should give. Um, now, the LMS also should analyze this for you. Uh, and so with an Empower system, uh, the, the LMS will actually look at the patterns. It'll look at the average, that's a straight line. It'll look at a thing called the linear trend. Okay, it'll look at a thing called the curvilinear, the curvilinear trend. And it'll actually show, show you the graphs there. And then it'll tell you mathematically which of those trends is best. You can see that to the right. You know, the uh, LMS is saying, okay, these three scores, we have to look at them now, realizing they all have error. We'd say that, you know, linear trend is, that's the most accurate, the one that close, most closely fits the data. 
You know, and if you were just using that for that, the summative score at this point in time would be a 2.79. Now, what it does, you know, what the LMS does is it does a very detailed analysis uh, of uh, the scores. In this case, it looks like uh, there are six scores here over a period of time for a single student on a single topic. Student got a 1.5 and then a 2.0 and then a 2.0 uh, and then a 2.5 uh, and then a 3.0 and then a 4. Okay, as those are entered, everything is recalculated, you know, and the graph that this is honing in just in the graph is that, you know, it'll look at the average, which in this case is a 2.5. It'll look at what would be the summative score if you use the curvilinear trend, a 3.14, and it will look at what would be the summative score if you were using the linear trend, 3.68. And it'll tell you which of those trends is better again. Imagine if this were done systematically, teachers were expanding the types of assessments that were given, uh, which would then allow for a lot of variation in terms of how they gather information from students. Those students who don't do well on paper pencil tests, those students who don't like them, uh, you know, language, uh, they're non-native English speakers, uh, they're just not engaged in taking the test. You'd have many other ways of gathering assessment data. And then that is, and that the teacher just enters the data, you know, and then let the, you know, let the system analyze it and say, here's, you know, here's the best uh, mathematically, this is a score that makes the most sense. And then the teacher uses his or her judgment to identify, well, okay, at this point in time, the sum of score I would put would be this right here. It always amazes me that, um, like everybody else, I have an iPhone, I have a couple of them actually, uh, which I carry around, which has all kinds of apps. And my phone will tell me how many steps I've taken. You know, if I enter data, it'll tell me how many calories I've eaten. Uh, there, are, there are apps that will, uh, will allow you to look at your heart rate. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is all in my hand. And I use that, I really do. I mean, it's a tool, Matt, you know, the tool, information that I use to make decisions. Why don't we do the same thing, you know, with our LMS actually? Not just a place to analyze, to enter data and analyze it simply in terms of like get the average, but actually, you know, analyze it in a number of ways to account for, you know, the inherent error there is in all paper pencil tests. And there's error in every assessment, okay? But when you put a bunch of those, uh, those assessments with error together and look at the pattern over time for a single topic, you know, that's your best way. Uh, that's the best way to get the most accurate estimate of where a student is at that point in time or the summative score. Thank you.